Amen. Jeremiah chapter 9, starting at verse 1. Jeremiah, most of you know, is referred to as the crying prophet. And tonight we'll be looking at what brought tears to his eyes. Starting off at verse 1, it says, Oh, now remember, this is written by the prophet himself. Oh, that my head were waters, and that my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. He understood what was going to happen. God had showed him the judgment that was going to come upon a disobedient people. And he had the frustration of being the one that going out and telling them that you need to turn, you need to stop because judgment is coming. But the people not only refused his warnings, but they were even contrary to him and that the damage that they did to him and the, and the conflict that they brought into his life. And it just, it was just so obvious to him that it just broke his, his heart. And so we got to consider this. Do these things break your heart? I mean, we see the people that we minister to, some in our family, some maybe just strangers, maybe in the workplace, whatever, but does their destruction, does the fact that they're going to receive judgment, does it break your heart? I mean, contemplate that, think about that. Does your heart really break? Just as surely if somebody was standing in front of you and you realized that in two minutes they were going to have a heart attack or somebody was going to come up and shoot them and they died, as much as that would break your heart, does it break your heart that they're going to be standing before a holy God in absolute terror apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because when it comes to the judgments of the Bible and those who will be judged, we have to consider ourselves as far as what attitude we may have. Do you find yourself with even a hint of joy, or do you sense within yourself an element of great grief? Why would there be joy? Well, we can so easily be of the mindset, they were warned. They ignored the warning, so they're just getting their just due judgment. Ultimately, the only one who finds joy in the judgment of anybody is the devil. But really what we need to look at is, is what was the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ for those who would reject him? Well, in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, in the Lord's triumphal entry, it says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. It broke his heart saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And really, speaking of his mere existence, Messiah is there, but they're rejecting Messiah. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. You did not know the time when Messiah was going to come. They should have because they had the word of God. Daniel chapter 9 told them the exact day or at least the exact time when that was going to happen. So you can look at the unsaved and you can say, well, they're just getting what they deserve. I remember when I shared the gospel with them that they put me down. They, 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 they just kind of blew me off. And so, again, they're getting what they deserve. I, I kind of had that, I confess, with my father. My father, as he refused the gospel message, as I tried to give it to him, again, as a heart for love, wanting to see my dad come to the Lord, only to have my dad refuse it. And then have him have cancer and sit on his bed and tell him, tap me on the leg and say, Michael, I don't want you sharing the things out of the Bible with me anymore. They just make me feel uncomfortable. And just thinking, here he is on, on the doorstep of death, and he's still refusing but we don't give up, especially when it comes to the ones that we love. Most of you know my dad ended up receiving the Lord on his deathbed. But we need to have a heart that continues, continually mourns for the unsaved. Because if you find a mourning well up inside of you when considering the judgment of nations, know that that is truly from the Lord. This is grief that we all have because of the judgment that comes from... Well, it's the judgment that comes from the knowledge and the existence of grace. This grief is what I'm talking about. Comes from our knowledge of the experience of grace. To understand that I should be judged too. That I was due that sentence of death that the unbeliever is going to give. But God had chose to save me. Again, that should be a motivation in my life. The proper, the grief that we will have because of judgment, it comes from a proper understanding of God's sacrificial love. That he died, that he paid the price for me. 
I did a benediction this morning for the YMCA. They were honoring some veterans, and there was people that had served even as early as World War II and um, in Vietnam, and, and some people that they, they weren't there, but they were spoken of who were serving today. And I, I used 1 John 15, 14, greater love has no man than this, than to lay, not 1 John, but John. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. The ultimate, the ultimate love, is the, ex, the expression of love, is, is sacrificing yourself for somebody else. And I'm just thinking, sacrifice, it's the essence uh, of, of our faith, no doubt, but it's also the essence of this nation, how, how God used that and used that dynamic. And we see the people who've gone before us who have sacrificed for these great freedoms that we have. And, and I see how all of this is tied in, not on par with what Jesus Christ has done. Nothing is. But again, we see that element sewn into the fabric of our society. And it's that which we need to appreciate because it was through God's sacrificial love for us that we have entrance into eternity. And this grief that we will have because of the judgment that comes upon the unsaved, well, it comes from the awareness of the reality and the permanency of judgment. That those people who would die apart from Christ, the Bible describes it as outer darkness, but it's an outer darkness for all of eternity. And it's a place of fire and brimstone. Now, how can it be outer darkness but also have fire and brimstone? Where brimstone is an alkali, it, it, you, know, you know what an acid will do in an acid burn? Well, this is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum from acid, and it burns just as badly. And the idea is, is there's going to be this, no fire, but just this sizzling burning that's going to happen. Where does the darkness come? The darkness comes because there's no presence of God in that place. It's a place that is absolutely void of the presence of God. And the idea is that the people who go there are people who have refused God in their life to such a degree that it's going to happen on a per personal but also a permanent level. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, God says, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Now, if there's anybody that should take pleasure in that, would be God, because it's him who they sin against. But he says, says the Lord, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. And the idea here is, the way the verbiage reads, is that God does have no pleasure at all that the wicked should die. Not at all. Not even all the way up until the end. We see in the parable of the day laborers that he'll save man as long as man has breath and cries out to him. God will give him salvation. God's desire is that he would turn from his ways and that he would live. That we would see see that we're sinners, that we would repent of our sin, and that we would come back. And that's the idea behind the prophet, although, I say the prophet, the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah was called to give this message, and as we'll go through Jeremiah, we'll not see one person get right with God. But nonetheless, God is giving them the opportunity. Why does God give the opportunity? When we studied Isaiah, we saw that God inhabits eternity. He, he would have known that Jeremiah, even though, because we saw it the first chapter, remember, God sent them. God sent him with the foreknowledge that not one person would get right with him. But nonetheless, he still sent him with a message. Now, it wasn't going to be, well, okay, this person. No, God knew that not one person would be receptive of that message. But nonetheless, he sent them anyway. And the idea is, is so that God would be just when he judges. The idea is, is that these, these people stand before God. They had that opportunity. The opportunity was given to them by the grace and the love of God, but they refused it. And so we give the gospel. God will do it to validate judgment, although that's not to be to the forefront of our minds. What is to be the forefront of our minds is that that person would not enter into judgment, that that person would turn from his ways and live. And the idea is eternal life. So if God would have no pleasure in the judgment of the guilty, then why should we? and even make it more personal. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, there's the testimony of all of mankind. Your testimony is contained in here. There will be some little tweaks here, because we all come from different backgrounds, but all in all, this is our testimony. And you he made alive who were dead. Spiritually speaking, we were dead in trespasses and in sins, and once you once walked or conducted your lives according to the course of the world, that world is that which is contrary to God, according to the prince of the power of the air, that would be Satan, 
the Spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. And then verse 4, those two great words, but God. It was but God. But God entered into this equation. How did God enter into that equation? Somebody who was going to take no pleasure in your eternal death entered in and shared the gospel with you. And it was God who met you through that. And it was God because you heard the gospel and because you responded to the gospel, it was God who caused you or made you to come alive. And then he separated you from this world because we know the world's going to be destroyed. And he separated you from the prince of the power of the air because we know that the devil is going to be condemned. You are now a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's an amazing thing when you think about it. I I look at my life and how long I was in rebellion to God, not really even wanting to hear the message, but then God caused me to become alive to it. And as I became alive to it, I received him. And now instead of eternal darkness, it's going to be his wonderful light. It's tonight that we see the burden of the Old Testament excuse me, the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament witness in that both have the knowledge of the way of life and death. We, we understand and we know what is, what is necessary for those to come into eternal life. Both have been given the word of God so that sinners may live. It's very obvious with the prophet because a lot of the times it's thus saith the Lord. But we have the word of God. We believe it. We understand it. We know it. it's the un- inerrant word of God that's able to change souls. Both the New Testament witness and the Old Testament prophet have experienced the rejection of the only way that man may be saved. If you ever share your faith, the first thing usually that you will experience and the thing that you will be experiencing the most for the most part is rejection rather than acceptance because the message we preach is contrary to the people of the world out there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, it's foolishness to the natural man. God has to do that work within their hearts. How does God do the work within the hearts? It's through the word of God. How does the word of God enter into their lives? It does so through you. How will they know without a preacher? Implied answer is, is that they won't. That's our reason, that's our purpose, that needs to be our passion. It's in the response to the message we speak that we will find either immense joy or great grief. But that's just the way it is. That's the way it is. And again, you see it even with the Lord Jesus Christ as he mourned for Jerusalem, but also there was joy for even one sinner who got right with the Lord. John chapter 3, 19, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So tonight we'll be looking at the heart of the prophet in the face of a disobedient people. And so the first thing is, is the knowledge, and there has to be the knowledge with the preacher, the one who has been called to share the word of God, of a coming destruction. Jeremiah was well aware. We've seen it already. We're going to be seeing it as we go through the various chapters Destruction is coming. There's no doubt about it. God has spelled it out for him. We know the same thing. As we go out into the world, we understand judgment's coming. I mean, we've seen the precursors of it. Now, we're told that these things are birth pangs. When my kids were born, pretty much all of them, the twins were born cesarean, but at least Sean and Chelsea, there were the Braston Hicks contractions. There was some false alarm contractions, and there were the real contractions. But even then, the real contractions, I remember, I think it was with Sean, there was almost, what, 14, 16, 18 hours? I mean, she just held on to that thing forever. But it it just seemed like, you know, but when they started and she said, this is it, I thought we were going to have a baby in like five minutes, so we flew down to the hospital, but it didn't work out that way. Well, it's the same thing with the birth pangs that we're experiencing now. What the signs that we see, what did Jesus say? He said to watch, and we see the signs of the time, and it seems like, well, the one thing we do know is is that judgment of this world, the destruction of this world, is one day closer than it was yesterday. And again, that needs to be a motivation in our heart, because you don't know if you have tomorrow. Now, you have eternity with Christ, I'm assuming everybody here is born again, but we don't know if we have tomorrow to share with those people who aren't. 
again, it needs to be a motivational factor. So, do you have the heart that the prophet has here again in verse 1? Oh, that my head was waters, and that my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Have you ever prayed for the Lord to break your heart for the things that break his? This is what should happen when God answers that prayer, that there should be an outward expression of a broken heart. Outward expression of a broken heart of people who have died and death is just so so ugly. Experiencing that little, you know, the opportunity that we may have for that death of that little girl who her parents just sent her out on to school that one day and unable to come back. This is also why Jeremiah, as I said before, is known as the weeping prophet. He personally experienced the truth. He personally experienced its rejection. And he's going to experience the resulting judgment. He's going to see Jerusalem and the temple completely destroyed. Now again, think of what this does to the Jewish psyche. All of God's promises are all tied up in his love for Israel. And all of that is, according to the Jewish mind, it's all tied up in the existence of the temple. Because the temple is the picture of the existence of God to God's people for the common Jew. So just think that one day, if you're a common Jew standing there and you look at that temple and you think, and they they did to their detriment thinking that there's somebody special because of the existence of that temple and God in that temple, although the spirit has, has long since gone. But nonetheless, they understand that through that we have these promises and we have this future of God. They had taken it for granted, but nonetheless, it still represented all that. And then comes the day when Babylon comes marching into town And they destroy that. And I can imagine, when you go to Israel, you'll see, if you ever see pictures, there is this temple mount. It is up on a hill. And and so I can imagine, as the temple was built up even from there, it's the highest place in that area. And so you would have this temple looming over the whole area, and then one day, it's gone. Remember the skyline of New York when when the uh, World Trade Centers were were taken down? I don't remember what I was watching. I was watching something not... Oh, it was a... uh, Ken Burns' documentary on the Statue of Liberty, and they were showing the New York skyline, and there were the Twin Towers, and that's just been forever changed, and it's just kind of an amazing sight now, as you've gotten used to seeing it without them, to see it again with them, so you can imagine for the Jew, as Babylon was able to go in there and destroy the temple, he'd be perplexed about that. What does this mean? What does this mean for us? Does this mean that God has cast us off forever? Even Jeremiah, it's all you had to do was repent. As a people, it's all we had to do was repent. And all this would have passed by. God would have forgiven us, but here it is. He, he's destroyed this. What does this do for the future? And what does this do for all that he has? Well, later on, God would, God's going to say through the prophet, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. So God's still got a future, and we can look back and see the temple being rebuilt, and we, we know the history of that. But at that moment, it had to be death and destruction. What about the promises of God? And what about the plans of God? And even the prophet, and they really believe that it's not just the destruction of people. It's all tied up in all that God had for his people. And now he's seeing it all fall apart because of their disobedience and their rebellion against God. Now, again, he he, he preached this judgment that he himself experienced. Not that he was judged, but he saw Babylon come in and all that they did. We preach a judgment that we're never going to see. And, And so we can become hardened to it. You're not going to experience the great tribulation. You're going to be in heaven. If you're a born-again believer today, during that time of great tribulation, you are going to be in heaven. And you're not going to be up on heaven looking over the edge and thinking, ooh, wow, look at all those plagues and look at everything that's going on. You're going to be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where your attention is, is going to be. It's the great hope that we have within us. Heaven is not going to be a place of mourning. You're not going to experience the great white throne judgment. It's those people who have died apart from Jesus Christ. And then after the great white throne judgment comes outer darkness, which we will never experience as well. Jeremiah will see the destruction of the country and the temple, the crushing of the people, and the ravaging of the land. We don't have a clue as Americans. We don't have a clue as Americans. Every once in a while we have a natural disaster, an act of God, such as Houston or such as Puerto Rico and you know some of the things that have been, you know, Las Vegas with the shootings and all New York this past week. And... We experience just a little taste of these things, but never have we experienced just a land that has come in and been completely sacked. 
Warren Wiersbe said, this attitude for the lost does not exist today for the most part because it is hard to find tears of mourning for the lost in the pulpit or in the pews today. To have that breaking of a heart for the lost, either in the pulpit or in the pews today. Matter of fact, it's been said the worst condition of a society or the, the worsen the society becomes, the more humor is heard from the pulpit. Rather than telling people of the hard things and of the difficult things, it's more of a place that we see um, Joel Steen's ministry or whatever it might be, trying with the focus, trying to make people feel better about themselves. Well, trying to make people feel better about themselves in a sinful condition, that's of the devil. To, for people to understand the disaster that is coming upon them, that's of the Lord. And again, the people here in Jeremiah's day didn't want to hear about the disaster. That was of the devil. But you have the one man who's of the Lord, and you see he's preaching a message that's not very popular. Next we see that it, what it was that caused his tears was a national corruption, verses 2 through 8. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place for travelers, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they are all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. They are not valiant for the truth on the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil. And they do not know me, says the Lord. Everyone take heed to his neighbor, and do not trust any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanderers. Everyone will deceive his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves to commit iniquity. Your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, says the Lord. Therefore, because of these things, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and try them, for how shall I deal with the daughter of my people? Their tongue is an arrow shot out. It speaks deceit. One speaks peacefully to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he lies in wait. First, we see that Jeremiah has an attitude that we can all have as well. Again, verse 2. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place for travelers that I might leave my people and go from them. If only I could just kind of check out from all of this. If only I can just go out. Can't we get Calvary Chapel, Ontario, buy some property, maybe up in the mountains somewhere or out in the desert and just kind of pull within ourselves and we'll have the Calvary Chapel, Ontario commune. That sounds kind of peaceful. That sounds kind of serene. Sounds kind of nice. And then we don't have to deal with all the stuff that is going on in the world. But God has called us to go out into the world. God has not called us to pull within ourselves. And as great as Acts chapter 2 and verse, well, really from verse 39 to the end of the chapter is and what was going on there, God saw that, well, we need something to disperse these people. Now they were pulling in because they needed to be taught and they needed to be strengthened. There's no doubt about that. Then what did God do? Well, in the midst of their calmness, he got a big rock of persecution and threw it in the, like throwing it in the middle of a pond. And what did he do? He dispersed the saints by doing that because it was necessary for them to go to the ends of the world. And it's necessary for us to go into the fabric of our society today. We're not to pull back. We're not to go away. Now, we do need times of retreat and whatnot and refreshment. There's no doubt about that. Even the Lord Jesus Christ had that. But we are to be out in that world. Proclaiming judgment, pointing out sins, correcting people is not supposed to be enjoyable. It's not supposed to be fun. If there's anybody here that enjoys proclaiming judgment, pointing out sins, correcting people, you need to check your heart. Again, we should have the same attitude as the prophet had. But within himself... This is a big thing for him to deal with. He's looking at these people and understanding what's about to come upon them. King David had a bit of the same attitude in Psalm 55, verses 1 through 8. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and moan, and moan noisily because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. For they bring down trouble upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearless, fearlessness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and the tempest. 
But that's not what God has called us to do. Our time of wandering off, going away, flying away as a dove, or whatever it might be, is the time that we spend in God's Word. It should be the time that we come here at church. It's why there's to be no divisions within the body of Christ. We're to be unified for the purpose of preparation, but also restoration, and how much more so restoration of the saints that seek to do the will of God. Living a life sold out to God and to deliver God's message is hard. And what I mean by hard, it is definitely contrary to our nature. Next, we see what caused the prophet's desire for refuge. The last part of verse 2, For they are all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. The adultery that they are committing is against the Lord with the false gods of the people of the land. Again, that's why God told the people when they were going into the promised land to enter in and to wipe everybody out because he knew that evil would influence them and sooner or later evil would grasp their souls. A false god? Well, we can think that we have none in our society today, but there's false gods aplenty. A false god is anything that you allow between you and your relationship with the Lord. I can bring up examples, but really what you need to do is take inventory of your life. Take inventory of your life. Is there anything in your life that has damaged your relationship with Jesus Christ, that has stolen your time from your relationship with Jesus Christ? And again, we're all different walks. We're all in different places. We need to take this inventory. Now, I'm going to say this, and then I'll qualify it, but the last couple of weeks... I have heard, especially on Facebook, I have heard more Christians talk about the Dodgers than I have ever heard them speak about Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that Dodgers are an idol in their life, but we do need to consider these things. I mean, freely speaking about the Dodgers, but never speaking about the Lord. I mean, that would be fine if the Dodgers could save souls, but the problem is the Dodgers couldn't even save themselves. They couldn't even beat the Houston Astros. Now, it was kind of weird in that I was sitting on the couch the last couple of, it was last uh, Saturday night. My wife says, is World Series on tonight? And I go, yeah, I think it's on right now. She goes, oh, okay. And I was just sitting there reading, and she said, is it on TV? And I go, yeah, it's on, it's on TV, I'm pretty sure, yeah. She goes, well, what channel is it going to be on? And I go, it's on Channel 11. She goes, okay. And then, lo and behold, the World Series came on the TV. My wife is an adulteress. <laughs> my wife is not an adulteress. My wife loves the Lord. There's no doubt about it. And as I said, I would qualify. There's nothing wrong with enjoying yourselves. There's nothing wrong with entertainment. There's nothing wrong with the Dodgers, and there's nothing wrong with baseball. Not whatsoever, unless you let it get out of control. Just my point in the whole matter is, is that sometimes we need to adjust or, or at least reexamine our priorities. And when something like that starts to get to be a little bit bigger than our relationship with Jesus Christ, We've got to reevaluate things and set things right once again. The people also act treacherously. This means to act in a fraudulent manner. The people, the people were, well, they were taking advantage of one another. And, and really, you know, what's the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is to love others as we love ourselves. But really, our love for God can be gauged in the manner in which we treat one another. And if we're treating one another treacherously, if we're defrauding one another or taking advantage of one another, where is our relationship with the Lord? Where is our relationship with the Lord when we start putting things, you know, building resources as a higher priority than the souls of people, either the souls are unsaved or the souls of the people who attend the church? I mean, the reason the church exists is for you guys. It's not for me to have a job. It's not for this building to exist, but it's for the people. It needs to be a place of teaching and training for the people. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, I'm not going to turn there, but Paul, he was seeing the damage that Peter and even Barnabas was doing to the saints when Jews from Jerusalem were coming up to the area of Galatia. He saw that they were playing the hypocrite, that it was an unclean thing in the Jewish mind to, for a Jew to eat with Gentiles, but Peter and Barnabas understood the grace of God and how salvation has gone to the Gentiles, so they were eating with them, except for when those people came from Jerusalem. When those people came from Jerusalem, then they were separating themselves, and Paul was looking at that and saying, that's not right. In essence, what he was saying, they're acting treacherously towards those people. They're going to cause those people to stumble. 
especially, well, if it was obvious to Paul, it was probably obvious to the people that these guys are acting one way. They're two-faced. They're asking one way when the Judaizers aren't here, and then when they blow into town, they're acting completely another way, and they were going to do damage to faith. So we need to act and conduct ourselves in a pure manner amongst ourselves. Then we see how it broke the prophet's heart, that there was no desire for truth. Look at verse 3. And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. They are not valiant for truth on the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. We live in a society that is described by people who describe such things as a postmodern society. A postmodern society is a society that does what is right in their own sight. Really what it is is that truth is as you define it. And so what may be a truth to you is not necessarily a truth to me and vice versa. But we look at the results of such a society. The results of such a society, looking at our society, we can't even judge what a male and female is anymore. And it's because we've gotten away from that. We can't describe or discern what's right and wrong. And matter of fact, the laws of our land have become fluid, which is completely contrary to what a law is. As a matter of fact, I just saw today on, and it was on CNN, and it was Elizabeth Warren, who's a Democrat to the core, whose beliefs I'm contrary to, but nonetheless, they were bringing up some of the things that happened at the last conviction, not conviction, but uh, primary. And she was the person who was the head of the DNC, <clears throat> Democratic National Convention, has just written recently written a book and was talking about Hillary Clinton and her campaign's involvement in the DNC. And they're saying they, she pretty much took it over. And they said, so Hillary pretty much hijacked the election? And Elizabeth Warren said, yes. 